the early 1800s, black families began settling along McGregor's Creek in the tiny town of Chatham, which was then known as the Forks. Once here, blacks flourished in business, education, medicine, sports, literary, and culture arts. And news of their successes attracted people from all over North America to the area. By 1857, Chatham was quoted as being a colored man's parent. I'm Maddie. And I'm Emma. Come journey with us as we highlight the struggles and successes of the black people in Chatham. Painting a picture of resilience and triumph in this Chatham Kent Black Historical Society and Black Method Museum virtual tour. People of African descent were setting, settling in the Chatham area in the early 1800s. Regardless of the circumstances from which they came from, early blacks were able to utilize their skills as Chatham held many opportunities for them. One of the earliest settlers in Chatham was Sally Yangs, a fur trader and Oneida woman who settled along the Thames River in the late 1790s. Sally brought at least one slave with her named Frank who helped her clear her land and build her cabin. It is largely believed that Frank was the first black living in Chatham. Chatham quickly became a hub for blacks coming from the United States. With the passing of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850 in the United States, blacks came flooding into Canada. The Fugitive Slave Act allowed for the capture and return of runaway slaves within the territory of the U.S. However, this law affected both slaves and free blacks because if they were suspected of being a runaway slave, they could still be captured and sent south into slavery. Therefore, there was a large influx of runaway slaves and free blacks fleeing the United States and coming into Chatham. Chatham was an ideal destination for those traveling on the Underground Railroad because it was located inland and off the border. Slave catchers tended to only frequent border cities such as Windsor or Amherstburg, which was only a short trip for them. Chatham, on the other hand, was hours away by foot, making it much safer. One amazing story we feature at the museum is that of Eliza Harris. Eliza was a slave in Kentucky. After hearing her master was planning on selling both her and her baby, Eliza decided to make an escape. She made her escape in the middle of the night with her baby. When she reached the Ohio River, she found it was not frozen over, therefore not a viable escape route. She sought refuge, but the next day her slave catchers were after her. Seeing that the Ohio River had chunks of floating ice, she decided to jump from ice sheet to the next while carrying her baby in her arms until she reached the free soil of Ohio. She later settled in the Chatham area. This story was made famous in Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Eliza Harris's real name was actually Mary. This display highlights the individuals who came to Chatham and how they ended up here. It is important to realize that early blacks were not all escaped slaves from the United States, rather they came from all over and from many different circumstances to make up Chatham's large black population. As time went on, Chatham's black population continued to grow, and black-owned businesses were beginning to flourish. By the 1860s, Chatham had six practicing black doctors, including Dr. Martin Delaney, Dr. Amos Array, and Dr. Anderson Ruffin Abbott. Dr. Martin Delaney stopped the 1856 cholera outbreak in Chatham with his innovative four-point sanitation program. Dr. Anderson Ruffin Abbott was the first black-born Canadian to be licensed as a family doctor and served as a surgeon for the Union Army during the Civil War. Chatham also had many black-owned blocks, such as the Hunton, Charity, and Murray blocks. The Charity block was home to the Provincial Freeman during its time in Chatham. The Provincial Freeman was a newspaper owned by Marianne Shad Carey, the first black female editor in North America. She was also a teacher and became a lawyer at the age of 61. Her newspaper was devoted to the interests of black people as well as seeing an end to slavery and racial discrimination. Also in Chatham during the 1850s was award-winning gunsmith James Monroe Jones, a gunsmith and engraver who was born into slavery. His father was able to buy his freedom before he came to Chatham. James Monroe Jones married Emily Francis and they had six children together, two sons and four daughters. Three of these daughters became teachers, but by far the most renowned of his daughters was Sophia, who became the first black female doctor to graduate from the University of Michigan because women could not attend Canadian medical school at the time. This display highlights the hub that Chatham truly was for black people. Artifacts such as rifles made by Gunsmith Jones and a doctor's bag highlight this case. It shows how much of a mecca for black people the Chatham area was in the 1850s and 60s. 
Chatham was not only a hub in the sense that it housed successful black-owned businesses, but also in the fact that the blacks of Chatham led a full life. They had their churches, schools, and organizations they led and participated in. Besides the building our museum is housed in, you find the First Baptist Church, the Campbell AME Church, and the location of the Chatham BME Church. The First Baptist Church, located right next door to the Wish Center, was the location of the John Brown Convention and is now known as the John Brown Meeting House. Venturing down a few doors and across the street, you find the Campbell AME Church. After Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were ejected from the White Church, they started the African Methodist Church, which came to Canada as early as 1826. After tensions rose between members of the Methodist congregation, a new denomination was formed known as the BME Church. This church was the first location John Brown held his Chatham meetings, but was quickly kicked out due to the nature of Brown's plan. The BME Church remained standing until 1989 when the hydra was cut off and the building was pronounced dead. The location of this church is now our BME Freedom Park. These churches in the area were also instrumental in starting many of the organizations that supported the community. The Ladies' Union Aid Society was started in 1878 and remained in existence until the 1960s. The St. John's Lodge No. 9 Prince Hall Freemasons began in 1866. Since then, they have aided orphans, the elderly, and the black community of Chatham. This lodge is still active today. In 1889, the women's version of this organization was established, known as Elefta Chapter No. 1 Order of the Eastern Star. This group existed for the purpose of doing benevolent work in the community. Chatham also housed three schools for children and youth. After black families were unsuccessful in enrolling their children into local schools, they worked together to create their own, the driving force behind this being Israel Williams. The King slash Princess Street School was established in the 1840s and welcomed students no matter their racial background, thus creating the first truly desegregated school in Chatham. After the school burned down, two other schools were established, the Wilberforce and the Woodstock Industrial Institute. The Wilberforce Educational Institute was opened in 1873 and had 68 students and 6 teachers. It was an academic-based school and provided training required for those planning to attend university. It was first located on the corner of Princess and Wellington Street, was, but was relocated to King Street in 1887 until its 1952 demolishing. Although the building is no longer standing, the original barn on the property is still there today. The Woodstock Industrial Institute opened in 1908 and was a skill and trade based school. They taught dressmaking, nickel plating, music and blacksmithing, as well as a program in wireless telegraphy taught by Harold Jackson who made massive technological strides in the area. When the school closed in 1927, it became the J.G. Taylor Community Center and was torn down in 1984. In 1994, plans were made for a new community center, and in 1996, the Wish Center was opened, and the Chatham-Kent Black Historical Society and Black Mecca Museum found its home. This display houses artifacts such as the BME Church Bible and the telegraph machine that belonged to Harold Jackson, who helped Jack Beardall start CFCO, the radio station. Although Chatham was a hub for black people in Canada, discrimination remained a prevalent issue, both for Chatham's black citizens and for those carrying the burdens of loved ones still enslaved in the southern United States. Segregation was still in existence in the education system and in many white-owned businesses. Although this remained an issue, the black population at Chatham remained resilient and truly lived up to the provincial freeman's motto, self-reliance is the true road to independence. It is said some leaders are born from adversity and others are just born. The first are true of Chatham's black population and visitors as it became a hotbed for abolitionists, the most influential being John Brown. Brown used Chatham as the planning grounds for the 1859 Harper's Ferry, Virginia raid. The raid consisted of John Brown creating a secret constitution with many prominent Chatham businessmen in the First Baptist Church and going to Virginia to raid an arsenal in order to overthrow the U.S. Army. Osborne Perry Anderson was the only man from Chatham who went on the raid, and unlike John Brown who was hung, and never got to see his dream of seeing an end to slavery come true. Osborne Perry Anderson escaped their failed coup and returned to Chatham. Osborne Anderson is credited with writing the only first-hand account of that day, a voice from Harper's Ferry. Many people believe this raid was one of the inciting forces for the 1861 American Civil War. But discrimination did not end when United States slavery did. Many places we take for granted now, like hotels, 
restaurants, and theaters remained segregated. In 1947, the National Unity Association was formed of people from Buxton, Dresden, and Chatham working to see an end to the discrimination which came to legally pass in 1962 with the release of the Ontario Human Rights Code. This display highlights a gun that belonged to John Brown that was in the possession of Gunsmith Jones at the time of Brown's death, as well as valuable information about the 1893 desegregation of Chatham schools after much effort and many petitions to the school board from the Kent County Civil Rights League. Chatham has always been a hub for sports. Throughout the years, many teams in Chatham have excelled both at the provincial and national level. One of the first teams to not only win a provincial championship but to break a major color barrier was the Chatham Colored All-Stars. In October 1934, the Chatham Colored All-Stars won the Ontario Baseball Association Provincial Championships. They were the first black team in Ontario to win an OBA title. In 2002, the Toronto Blue Jays honored the Chatham Colored All-Stars by wearing a replica of their uniforms, one of which we have in our museum. The Chatham Colored All-Stars paved the way for other black athletes to succeed at higher levels. One example is Fergie Jenkins. Born and raised in Chatham, Fergie Jenkins played in the Major League for Philadelphia, Chicago, Texas, and Boston. In 1991, he became the first Canadian to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. We are honored to house many pieces of autographed Fergie Jenkins memorabilia and display it here at the museum. In Chatham, as elsewhere, music was a source of strength and encouraged a sense of community. When Reverend Walter Hawkins lost his three children, Music became a way to get him back on his feet, and the community rallied behind his choir, the Hawkins Troop. Chatham musician Bethune Murray was one of the first blacks in the area to receive a degree from the Toronto Conservatory of Music. He later moved to Chicago, where he composed his most remembered song, You Never Know Just What a Two-Cent Stamp Can Do, and is credited with the lyrics, artwork, and music for his hit Foxtrot song. Chatham has also produced very talented artists, who, although no longer reside in Chatham, have left their mark on the community. Artist Lane is a world-renowned artist whose work has made an important statement about community and African spirit. Lane has met and worked with individuals such as Nelson Mandela and Barack Obama. Artist was the artist who sculpted the bust of Mary Ann Chad Carey, the focal point of our BME Freedom Park. In 2009, she returned home to Chatham to unveil this piece of art and deliver the keynote address for the opening of the BME Freedom Park. This display highlights some of Chatham's most renowned individuals. They have traveled far and wide and have made Chatham proud. It is no secret that racism was a prevalent issue in Canada. In this display, we pay homage to blacks in the Chatham community who made strides for equality for all. This display highlights the achievements of Blanche Pryor, Ona Morris, Cora Prince, and Marian Johnson were the first black nurses to graduate from Chatham Hospital, as well as the accomplishments of Eddie Wright, who was not only the first black to play on the Chatham Junior Maroons, but also the first black to be named head coach of a university hockey team when he was named head coach of the University of New York at Buffalo. This display also speaks to the accomplishments of Andy Harding, Chatham's first black police officer, Wyatt Wallace, who made technological strides at the public general hospital, and Ken Milburn, who was Chatham's first paid black firefighter and eventually became the fire chief. These people and more made strides towards equality for all and paved a way for not only blacks in Chatham, but all over Canada. The archive room located in the side room of our Black Mecca Museum is filled with well-organized binders on schools, churches, and athletes, as well as census and cemetery records. It is filled with family genealogy binders for over 400 black families in the area with in some cases records dating back to the early 1800s. A valuable aspect of the museum walking tour is the BME Freedom Park. Situated next to the St. John's Lodge Number no. 9 and on the site of the first BME church in Canada, the highlight of the park is the bust of Mary Ann Shad Carey among flowers, original church cobblestone and brick, plaques, a quilt patch, and a little free library. The bust has stood since 2009 and was sculpted by Artist Lane, descendant of Mary Ann, for many, this park is the highlight of the museum walking tour. We hope you enjoyed our virtual tour, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. We would love to see you in the museum. Or out on a walking tour.